Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Ariel Procaccia from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, Ariel does amazing work at the intersection of artificial intelligence, theory, and economics. Um, his work spans many, many different topics, ranging from fair division to voting to machine learning and beyond. He does foundational work um, on the theoretical side, and he takes his ideas all the way to practice. For example, building some non-for-profit website called splitit.org that you could take your fair division problems to, and a number of other things of that nature. He's um, recipient of the Ichikai Computers and Thought Award, Sloan Research Fellowship, NSF Career, and a number of other awards, many pa best paper awards, and it's a great pleasure for us to have him talk about democracy. Thank you very much, Anna. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so the topic of the talk is extreme democracy. And I want to start with this quote uh, from Pia Mancini. She is an Argentinian uh, politician and activist. She gave a very popular TED talk a couple of years ago where she quoted Marshall McLuhan, who was a Canadian uh, professor, as saying that politics is solving today's problems with yesterday's tools. Now, you may be wondering why I'm not quoting Marshall McLuhan directly. The reason is that he didn't actually say that. He said that our age of anxiety is the result of trying to do today's jobs with yesterday's tools. Nevertheless, I really like Pia Mancini's version of the quote about politics, so I'm going to um, you know, attribute this quote to her. And the point I want to make here is closely related to this, which is that the world has really changed in the last couple of decades because of modern technology, but the way in which we do democracy hasn't fundamentally changed for centuries. And it seems like a really good time to think about you know, how we do democracy, think, you know, rethink democracy to some degree. And the theme of the talk is going to be that computer science can play a big role in this discussion, both in terms of thinking about uh, the practice of democracy, how we do democracy, and also in terms of thinking about expanding the potential reach of democracy. So thinking about new application domains where this combination of computational thinking and democratic thinking, if you will, can give us new ways to accomplish our goals. So I'm going to illustrate this theme uh, through three topics that we've worked on in the last year or so. The first is liquid democracy, which is a new paradigm that allows voters to delegate their votes to others. The second is participatory budgeting, which is uh, the idea that a local government, usually a city, engages its residents in the process of allocating the budget or some part of the budget. And the last part will be virtual democracy, which is a term I came up with for the purposes of this talk. But the idea is that we are going to have a virtual election among machine learning models of people, and we're going to aggregate their virtual preferences to make a decision. And I'll show you how we're thinking about applying this kind of approach in order to automate decisions on ethical dilemmas. So let's get started with liquid democracy. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Anson Kang and Simon McKenzie, and I'll give you the full references at the end of the talk. So a good place to start here is just positioning liquid democracy in the context of other forms of government that you're all familiar with. So one is um, you know, monarchy or dictatorship, something that's been popular for uh, many years in history. So here we have a king or a queen or a dictator, and when it's time to make a decision, there's only one vote that counts, and that's the vote of the uh, king or queen. On the other extreme, we have what's called direct democracy, which was famously practiced in ancient Athens. And the way it worked there is everybody would show up, all of the citizens would show up to the same place, and everybody would vote directly on uh, the issue at hand. Now, one caveat is that, uh, of course, not everybody could be a citizen. Women were not citizens, slaves were not citizens, but overall this allowed for you know, some measure of wide participation. A big shortcoming of this kind of approach is that it doesn't scale. So if you think about today's world with all of its complexities, it seems unrealistic to expect every citizen to be informed about every issue and really have the time to express an opinion about you know, all of the issues that come up. So partly for that reason, uh, we have what's called representative democracy, which is, um, you know, the way it works is we have professional politicians whose job it is to uh, be aware of the various issues. We elect some of them to parliament, uh, 
And when it's time to vote, they're the ones who actually vote uh, on our behalf. So this works reasonably well in many cases. The uh, you know, one shortcoming of this approach is that our representatives don't always vote according to the way we would want them to vote. And even worse, they may not vote with our best interests at heart. So this uh, motivates this new paradigm, liquid democracy, that you can think of as lying between direct democracy and representative democracy. So the way this works is every voter can vote directly on the, on the issue at hand, or they can choose to delegate their vote to another voter. And the crucial point is that these delegations are transitive. So if I delegate to Anna and Anna delegates her vote to Pedro, Pedro would vote on behalf of both Anna and me. So here's an example where we have a delegation graph. A directed edge from I to J says that I delegates to J. So what would happen here is that when we are actually voting on some issue, the sinks of this graph, the ones that don't have outgoing edges, we're not delegating, are the ones who actually vote. So in this situation, we're going to have two voters, this one and this one, who only vote on their own behalf. We have one voter here with a weight of two that votes on behalf of one other voter. And we have the super voter with a weight of six that votes on behalf of five other voters, everybody with a directed path to this voter. So to me, this seems like a really compelling idea, and it's been really gaining steam in the last few years. So there's been a, a number of systems uh, that have gained some traction built on liquid democracy. One is the liquid feedback system, which is, for example, being used by, by the German Pirate Party. It's a funny sounding uh, party, but it actually had quite a bit of political power a couple of years ago. And they used uh, the system, for example, to collaboratively decide on the pl party platform, what they want to advocate. More recently, there have been a couple of parties that basically suggested to hack the political system by running for parliament as usual. But what they said was, if we get elected to parliament, our representatives would vote according to the wishes of the party members, and those wishes will be determined by a liquid democracy-based system. So one example is the net party in Argentina. Pia Mancini is actually one of the founders of this party. They have a system called Democracy OS, which is built on liquid democracy. Another example is the Flux party in Australia. They have a system also called Flux. Now, unfortunately, neither party actually won any seats in parliament, but this was like a nice attempt that did attract quite a bit of attention to the idea of liquid democracy and its potential. So what I want to do is think about liquid democracy in a formal model and try to reason a bit about you know, when it works well and especially when it doesn't work well. So in this model, we're going to have a directed graph G where the vertices coincide with voters and we have an edge from I to J if uh, voter I knows voter J or even knows of voter J. Now I'm going to assume that there are only two alternatives. So it's a binary issue that we're deciding on. And moreover, one of them is correct and one is incorrect. So I'm thinking about the case where we have uh, some ground truth. And what voters are trying to do is determine this ground truth. So for example, think about a policy decision like tax reform. And imagine that we're evaluating it according to some objective measure, like will, you know, by how much will the national debt increase in five years? So according to this objective measure, one alternative is better than the other. Right? Under one, the national debt will, will increase uh, less than under the other, maybe even would go down. So we think of this better alternative according to the objective measure as the correct alternative, and we think of the other alternative as the incorrect alternative. Now when there are only two alternatives, there's only one reasonable to make, uh, way to make decisions, which is majority vote. And uh, remember that under liquid democracy, we could have some delegations, so we're going to look at the majority of weight given to any of the uh, two choices. Now in addition, every voter has a competence level PI, which is his probability of voting correctly. So the way to think about this is when it's time for me to vote, I try to estimate what, if I did decide to vote, I try to estimate what's the correct decision according to the information available to me and uh, whatever knowledge I have. And then uh, you know, I try to make a determination and I'm going to get it right with probability PI and I'm going to get it wrong with probability one minus PI. Now another important uh, definition is this idea of approval. 
So we say that voter I approves J if I knows J, if the edge IJ is in the graph. And moreover, crucially, voter J is more competent than I by a margin of at least alpha or more than alpha for some parameter alpha of the model. So this is uh, going to be a necessary condition for delegation, the fact that I knows J, and also we have this margin in competence. And this is, of course, a very strong assumption, right? Because it says that we can only delegate to people who are more competent, so this really helps liquid democracy. And the way I want to justify it is by noting that the main result that I want to tell you about is a negative result against liquid democracy. So by making this assumption that really helps liquid democracy, I'm only going to make the negative result more powerful. So let's see an example where things might go wrong. So this is our graph G, it's a star. It has only eight arms in the illustration, but think about many arms. And uh, the competence level of the arms will be 0 0.6, and the competence level of the center is 0 0.8. So it's significantly more competent. Let's say that alpha, this margin, is less than 0 0.2. So under direct democracy, all of the voters would vote independently, and then the expected number fraction of correct votes will be close to 0 0.6 times the number of vertices, and with high probability, the actual number will be close to the expectation. So with high probability, we will have a majority of correct votes. All right, so you know, this follows from any concentration inequality. It actually dates back. Independent. Independent, yeah, so the voting is going to be independent. Voting, uh, people's inf private information uh, is independent. Yes, yeah, so there's no correlation whatsoever. Um, yeah, notice that, by the way, you know, this example can be modified uh, even if we do have some correlation. Let me, I'll say a few words about this in, in 30 seconds. Um, so, you know, under direct democracy, we will have the right decision with high probability. Under uh, liquid democracy, you know, in a naive delegation model, everybody would delegate to the center. The center is more competent, so the center gets it right with probability 0 0.8, but the center also makes a mistake with probability 0 0.2, which is pretty significant. So here, even though everybody delegated to a more competent vertex, we're actually doing worse than before. And just to note, you know, regarding correlation, so for example, one thing you could say here is maybe, you know, everybody depends on the center. So if the center is correct, the arms would vote correctly with probability 0.61. And if the center is incorrect, it would vote, vote uh, correctly with probability 0 0.56. Right? So it would still give you 0 0.6 probability of being correct. Uh, so of course, like the example would be robust to this kind of, of thing. Um, right? So what you would get, I guess, is the arms are conditionally independent of each other given the center in this example, and things would, uh, would still work out. Uh, and some of the stuff I talk, I'll talk about can be extended to allow some measure of correlation, but we will assume independence. However, I think what naturally will be the case is that it's the most highly correlated voters that choose the same representative. So it's exactly the opposite of the situation. It's people who are very alike who will tend to pick the same representative. Right, but here... Which uh, makes this less bad. Yeah, I mean, in this... Uh, oh, I see. Um, right. So uh, I guess in the social network, we have the situation where people are not really connected to each other. Everybody is connected to the center. Right, so here, the only reasonable uh, model of correlation would be with the center, but you're absolutely right. Like if, if we did assume such a model, that would only strengthen this kind of result. Okay, so um, what we want to do is uh, you know, think about whether we can get around this kind of phenomenon uh, if we uh, allow for more clever delegation mechanisms. So what's a delegation mechanism? It's going to be a function that observes the underlying graph G and the approval relation, so it can't observe the exact competence levels, but it does have access to the approval relation. And it decides, possibly at random, whether each voter votes or delegates and to whom. Um, so I want to specifically think about local delegation mechanisms, which are mechanisms that, um, where the decision for voter I is based only on the approved neighbors of voter I. So it would look at the local neighborhood of I and make a decision based on which subset of the neighbors are actually approved. The motivation for this is that this is closer to what we have in the, uh, in the real world today, where voters make their own delegation decisions independently, only based on their local information. So this would actually give the mechanism a bit more power to make delegation decisions. So examples of these kinds of mechanisms are 
uh, delegate to a uniformly random approved neighbor, um, you know, delegate to, um, don't delegate at all with probability one half and delegate to a specific approved neighbor with probability one half, or even don't delegate at all, like if it says nobody ever delegates, that would just coincide with direct democracy. So, um, you know, what are the properties that we want? We define two minimal properties that we would want delegation mechanisms to satisfy. The first is basically formalizing the property that we had on the previous slide. So we call it do no harm. And slightly more formally, what it says is that for any epsilon, the loss, which is the difference between the probability of liquid, of uh, direct democracy making the right decision, and the probability of liquid democracy making the right decision, uh, is at most epsilon on all sufficiently large instances. Or in other words, the loss would go to zero as the instances grow larger. Now this can be achieved if you never delegate, if you just do direct democracy, because direct democracy wouldn't lose to itself. So uh, to make things uh, slightly less trivial, we introduce another minimal property that's called positive gain, which just says that there are some examples where liquid democracy actually outperforms direct democracy. So we can't just do direct democracy. And the negative result that I advertised before, um, you know, basically says that for any value of alpha, the parameter that governs when we delegate, the gap needed for delegation, there is no local delegation mechanism that satisfies the do no harm and the positive gain properties. So there's no local mechanism that would satisfy these two basic properties. So the, the proof of this theorem has some details and requires some uh, calculations, but I think the intuition behind it is very simple. So I want to try to illustrate the intuition to you in a couple of minutes. So the basic idea is that if you have a mechanism satisfying, yeah. So when you uh, looking at different instances, like the ability of individual voters to get each of them right won't change. Uh, I, I must heard the question when so looking at democracy. Like yeah. one of the problems was that there are too many things to decide about, and each individual doesn't have the ability to think about all of them. Yeah. That means that when it comes to different things, I have different ability to right. make the correct choice. Yeah. But here, like the abilities remain the same, or right. So the question was, you know, what, basically whether the competence levels yeah. are different from different issues. So all of this is done from the viewpoint of a single issue. Like we're thinking about, we're fixing the issue, and we're saying the competence levels are specific to this issue. There is another aspect, I think, of your question, which is, um, you know, why do we all, why are we all measuring this issue according to the same criterion? Right? When we think about competence level, it's the idea that we would make the right decision according to a fixed criterion. For that, this is another assumption, but it's again an assumption that helps look at democracy because we're all thinking about optimizing the same thing. So it's again an assumption that only strengthens this negative result. Okay, so uh, what's intuition here? If we have the positive gain property, there must be some neighborhood uh, where delegation actually happens. Right? Otherwise, we would just be doing direct democracy and would never be able to gain on any example. So let's say that this is such a neighborhood and we're taking the viewpoint of the gray vertex, right? And here what you're saying is uh, the gray vertex has three approved neighbors that are marked by dashed edges, and one uh, neighbor in the underlying graph that is not approved, uh, sorry, the solid edges are the approved neighbors, the dashed edge is the uh, neighbor in the underlying graph which is not approved. So what I'll do is I'll set competence levels for the vertices that will realize this approval relationship. So we're going to have three high competence vertices, and two low competence vertices, including the one whose viewpoint I'm taking. And next, uh, what I'll do is I'm going to take this neighborhood and replicate it in a way that keeps the same blue vertices, but replicates the green vertices. So we get something like this. And the crucial point is that from the viewpoint of each one of the green vertices, the neighborhood looks exactly the same as what we initially had. So a local delegation mechanism would uh, you know, uh, have every green vertex delegate to the blue vertices with some constant probability because that's where we started from. Now, in addition, we're going to add a cloud of these medium competence vertices uh, that are disconnected from everything else. Setting their competence level is kind of tricky, so it requires a bit of work to even show that what we want is feasible. But the way we do it is, in, is so that if everybody votes independently under direct democracy, then getting something close to the expected fraction of green vertices to vote correctly is enough for the majority vote to be correct. 
On the other hand, other liquid democracy, like we said, some fraction of the green vertices delegate to the blue vertices. Now, without that fraction, the majority will be wrong with high probability. And in addition, now all of these blue vertices have a lot of weight, and there's only a constant number of them. So with some constant probability, all of them vote incorrectly, and in that case, the majority decision is incorrect. So what we get is that under liquid democracy, we have a constant probability of making an incorrect majority decision. Under liquid democracy, we have a correct decision with high probability, and that creates this gap that violates the do-no-harm property. So what we see from this construction is that local delegation mechanisms are inherently flawed because they can't identify situations where few vertices amass a large number of votes. Of course, with non-local mechanisms, we can get around this problem. So one you know, naive idea would be to define this greedy cap mechanism that just says, you know, let's greedily uh, delegate votes according to what voters want, but we'll set a cap on the weight that can be amassed by any single voter, some cap C of N, and then you know, if you've already reached this cap, we say you can't get any more delegations. So in the situation with representative democracy, you really have essentially a situation, uh, you have this constant probability of, of having a bad situation because we only have a constant number of representatives. And so in some sense, it's a local mechanism where those blue vertices are representatives or potential representatives, really. Yep. Yeah, so. yeah, I agree. So, so Paul's point was, you know, this kind of situation can happen in, in uh, representative democracy as well because we're correlating all of the weight on our members of parliament and there aren't that many of them. And I agree. So essentially with liquid democracy, the, the question or what we wanted to achieve was design the delegation mechanisms in a way that, achieve, that, that uh, circumvents this kind of problem. Right, so with, with representative democracy, we're stuck in a pretty rigid system. Here we have more flexibility in how we think about when people delegate to others. People can vote directly or delegate. And it, you know, it, we were hoping that even with local mechanisms, we could get around this kind of problem. What the theorem tells us is that we can't actually with local mechanisms. Right? But however, with uh, non-local mechanisms, we can get around this problem. In particular, notice that we will avoid the situation where that we have in representative democracy with, very, with a lot of weight on particular uh, representatives. And uh, what we show is that under another truly mild assumption, if we set the cap correctly, then the greedy cap mechanism would satisfy both the positive gain and do no harm properties. So the proof of this is very long. I think there must be an easier way to prove it than we did, and I don't want to go into the proof. I do want to talk a bit about the conceptual implications of this result. So one interesting point is that people who have thought, who have been thinking about liquid democracy, uh, have been really worried about this, this phenomenon where few voters amass a large weight. Uh, in particular, in the German Pirate Party, this guy was the superstar. So he is a linguistics professor in Germany. And uh, he amassed so much weight that according to this article in Der Spiegel, quote, his vote was like a decree. So basically when he made a decision, he would shift the majority in the direction that he wanted. And of course, you know, many people who are not this guy were unhappy about the situation and thought that it's not democratic. So of course, greedy cap would get around the situation by imposing this cap and preventing people from amassing massive weight. But what I want you to take from this part of the talk is not that greedy cap is a great mechanism because that's not what I'm saying at all. Uh, remember that we only designed it to achieve two very basic properties that are not very compelling as a positive result. And moreover, we made assumptions that really help liquid democracy. So what I want you to take away is actually the negative result. The fact that local delegation mechanisms are inherently flawed and that centralized delegation decisions could be the next step for effective liquid democracy systems. In our ongoing work, we've been thinking about you know, how to design centralized delegation uh, mechanisms from an algorithmic perspective. And that's something I'd be, I'd be happy to talk about offline. Yeah. The fact that the edges in the underlying graph are 0, 1, they either exist or they don't, seems like a dramatically simplifying assumption. You know, I know you or I don't. Um, Particularly relevant to centralized delegation. Do you have thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't view it as a dramatic, that particular assumption as being dramatic. Um, so essentially what we're saying is I can only, 
you know, I can only delegate to J if I knows J. So he knows of the existence of J and like could potentially delegate if to I J. If I think of it as I'm allowed to delegate. Exactly, exactly. So we, I just think of it as like part of the necessary condition for delegation together with the, the this uh, gap in competence, right? Yeah, Pedro. I think the basic motivation for liquid democracy isn't necessarily that the representatives will make better decisions, it's that people just don't have time. So it seems like there's a very important thing missing here, which is like, yes, you know, liquid democracy will be worse than direct democracy, but we have to offset against the gain that, you know, yeah. people that way vote, otherwise they may not even vote. Right, so the way I think about it is, um, you know, people not having time translates to a low competence level. Uh, if you made them make, you know, make a choice, then they wouldn't be well informed and would make a right choice with low probability. And for that reason, you know, when we, um, when we delegate, like we would expect things to be better, at least like initially, we were hoping for things to be better under liquid democracy. Uh, so I think, you know, ideally liquid democracy should get around this, this problem of low competence by allowing delegation to more competent people, and that's what this negative result is trying to capture. Yeah. But is that the role in point of comparison or current representative democracy and not direct democracy? Uh, right, so, so as Paul was pointing out, I mean, the question was about comparison to current representative democracy. As Paul was pointing out, you know, the kind of issue I was talking about when you think about it in this mathematical model is also an issue in current representative democracy where we're focusing a lot of weight on this like small number of representatives that could make wrong decisions. What I mean though is that as far as the theoretical results, it might be worse than direct democracy but better than representative democracy. Oh, I see. Um, Right, so that's a good point. Um, uh, well, I guess you would need like a completely different model for, you know, if you wanted to think about, um, you know, instead of just saying we have these representatives and like the, the graph structure is like this, trying to model what representative democracy looks like and when it's likely to be successful, uh, this model wouldn't give you that. The reason why we're comparing to direct democracy is because of the feeling that, um, you know, this is essentially, in some sense, the ideal, right, where, where everybody is participating. And this is, and this is what we would have been doing if we didn't have this problem of low competence levels, right? So, so the motivation is coming from the fact that we would want direct democracy. It doesn't scale because of low competence levels. Therefore, we allow for delegation to overcome the idea that the problem that some voters might have lower competence and we want to, they want to give their vote to more competent uh, um, voters. And then, uh, you know, we're just saying this may not necessarily work unless you're careful about how you do the delegations. Uh, but uh, like having the camp like login would mean there should be a substantially large number of the population who have good competence, right? Because if I have a very limited number of people with good competence available, yeah. then we can't impose that cap. Right, uh, that's a good point. So what you're saying is, you know, there could be situations where we do have a very small, you know, maybe even a star where the center has competence one. In that case, I would want to delegate to the center, but now I'm, I'm you know, I am prevented by this gap and I would get the wrong decision. So that's true. I mean, we are taking this very specific viewpoint of comparing to direct democracy. Uh, and, and from that viewpoint, like that's our benchmark. That's what we're trying to compete with. You're absolutely right that in some examples, of course, uh, you know, we would want to remove the cap, and if we wanted to compare, uh, you know, um, the, just allowing everybody to delegate without a cap to a cap, we could be doing worse with a cap on some examples, right? So that's uh, definitely true. Cool. So uh, let's move on and talk about uh, participatory budgeting. Uh, so this is joint work with Kherdus Benade, Svoprava Nath, and Nisarg Shah. And um, as I mentioned briefly, the idea in participatory budgeting is that typically a city wants to allocate part of its budget, its budget according to the wishes of its residents. So people would express their preferences and we would aggregate those preferences to get a decision. So for example, you know, the, the kind of things people talk about are building you know, some uh, community center, building even a stadium, building a park, a bike lane, and so on. These are the kinds of projects people would vote on in many of these situations. So the origin of this idea dates back to the city of Porto Alegre in Brazil in 1989, so almost 30 years ago. So they kind of lost their minds and decided to allocate the entire city budget uh, using uh, participatory budgeting. And this has been a very successful experiment by many measures. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of work in social science uh, trying to understand did the city improve based on that? And the answer from what I gather is, is yes, according to many different measures. 
so this was really the, the first example, but over the years, and especially recently, this idea has really been catching on. So for example, uh, as far as I know, the world champion is Paris, which in 2016 had 100 million euro participatory budgeting election and committed 500 million euro by 2020. Uh, another example that we'll come back to is Madrid, that had a 24 million euro participatory budgeting election two years ago. In the US, uh, the New York City, for example, had a $40 million participatory budgeting election last year. And I just looked up Seattle, that seems to have a $3 million participatory budgeting election uh, this year. So it's not like a huge fraction of the budget, but it is a, a sizable commitment. And really the feeling is that the commitment to participatory budgeting is really growing very fast in more and more cities, and also cities are expanding their level of commitment. So uh, again, I wanna think in a rigorous model about how to do participatory budgeting, you know, what's the right way to approach it. So in this model, we're going to have a set of voters that are voting over a set uh, A of M alternatives. The total budget is some capital B, and every alternative A has a cost C sub A. Now every voter I has a utility UI of A for alternative A that measures the benefit that voter I derives if we implement alternative A as part of our set of implemented alternatives, one of the projects. Now for a subset of alternatives X, the cost of X, the total cost, is of course the sum over individual costs of projects in the subset. I'm also going to make the assumption that the utility I has for a subset X is the sum of individual utilities. Now, I think you know, this is often a strong assumption, this additivity, additivity of utilities, but here I think it's well justified because if you look at many of these real world cases, the projects are basically independent of each other. So there are um, almost no substitutes or complementarities and additivity kind of makes sense. Now the goal is to find a subset of alternatives X that maximizes what's called utilitarian social welfare so it's denoted using this notation, social welfare of the subset X for the utility profile U. So this is the sum over all voters of the utility I has for the subset X, the total utility derived by the voters. Subject to the budget constraints, we want a budget feasible subset. So this is the goal as defined by Ashish Goel from Stanford and his team. They've done very interesting work on both the theory and the practice of uh, participatory budgeting. I'll tell you a bit more about some of their ideas later. But you know, I guess for many of you, as you're staring at this goal, what you're thinking is this is just a knapsack problem where our alternatives are items, the weight of an item is the cost of the project, and the value of an item is the total utility to all of the different voters. So knapsack is an NP hard problem, but it's pretty easy in practice. The main obstacle is that we don't actually have access to these utility functions. Right? We can't really go around asking people, you know, what's your utility for every alternative, especially when you think about some of these real elections where in the final stage we have like, you know, up to 100 final projects, this would be very difficult for voters. So what instead happens in practice is that we ask voters to express their preferences using some kind of input format, which is a format for their votes and we aggregate these votes in order to make a decision about which subset to fund. So what I wanna do is tell you about a couple of input formats that people have been talking about, and I'll do it in the context of this imaginary city with a couple of imaginary alternatives, and I'm also going to take the viewpoint of one particular voter. So when I talk about utility, it's going to be from the viewpoint of one voter, and I'll show you how this voter maps her utilities into votes in different formats. So, uh, you know, one uh, possible alternative is building a town square which has utility eight to this one voter and cost nine. Uh, we could build a bike lane with utility two and cost one. We could build a park with utility three and cost two. Or we could invest in clean energy. This has utility six and cost six. Now, one natural, uh, you know, way in which to express preferences is just to sort the alternatives by order of utility. So this is called ranking by value, which would be ranking by utility in our case. Uh, and this would put uh, the town square first, then clean energy, then the park, and then the bike lane. Now another option uh, suggested by Ashish Goel and his collaborators is looking at value for money, which is the ratio of utility and cost. In our case, this would give the opposite ranking, 
where the bike lane would be first with a, with a ratio of two, uh, then the park with a ratio of one and a half, and so on. Now, the input format that uh, Ashish and his group are actually advocating is something they call knapsack voting. Uh, in uh, Europe, it's been used independently. For example, in the Madrid election that we talked about, they think of it as shopping cart votes. But the idea is that we just ask every voter to solve their personal knapsack problem. So we tell them, you know, here's the budget. Give me the subset of projects that's best for you under the budget constraint. So for example, here, if the budget is nine, then our voter would take uh, three of the projects, the uh, you know, energy, the park, and the bike lane. Together, they have a total cost of nine, which matches the budget. And of course, you can do better with a budget of nine. Now, the last input format is something that we advocate in our paper. We call it threshold approval. And the uh, idea is that I'm going to ask every voter to either approve or not approve a project. And the voter should approve a project or check it if its utility is above a given threshold. So for example, if I set the threshold at five, then my voter would approve the town square and clean energy and would not approve the other alternatives. So hopefully these all seem like reasonable. Yeah. So, but the cost is a negative utility, so what I would have done is rank by difference between utility and cost. <clears throat> cost is the amount of money uh, needed to build the project. Yeah, so spending money has negative utility. Sorry, so, so what's, your, what's your proposal? By, by some, let's say the simplest version is the difference of utility and the Oh, difference. Yeah, so this is sort of being captured by ranking by value for money, which looks at the ratio. Right, so here of the... Okay, sure. I mean, so this is a, definitely a valid idea. It's not something that, to my knowledge, anybody has looked at. Um, I think it's, it's more natural uh, psychologically to think about ranking by value for money, because essentially what you would tell voters is what's your bank per buck, um, right? Whereas if you look at the difference, um, you know, without having any evidence for this, it feels to me like something it would be more difficult to express and think about. Uh, but it's, you know, it's definitely a valid idea that would again capture the tension between higher utility and lower cost. Um, okay, so, so hopefully these all seem like reasonable input formats. And um, you know, the question is which one should we use? Um, so the main conceptual contribution of our work is giving a, an objective way in which we can compare different input formats. The way we do this is by relying on a framework that I've been calling implicit utilitarian voting in recent years. Uh, the, um, you know, so one uh, idea at its basis is the idea that every voter I will report a vote sigma I that is consistent with her utility function UI. And consistency is exactly what we saw in the previous slide, where you can take a utility function and map it, in, it induces some kind of vote in a given input format. So we're going to denote it using this uh, triangle notation. And uh, the, uh, right, so we want to look at randomized voting rules that take as input an input profile, a vector of votes, and map it to a budget feasible subset of alternatives, possibly at random. The main definition here is this definition of distortion, which dates back to work of mine with my PhD advisor, Jeff Rosenshain, in 2006. What it's trying to capture is the idea that we want to maximize utilitarian social welfare, but we don't have access to the utilities. So instead, we use the votes as a proxy for the utilities. And what this is trying to capture is how much we lose because of this lack of information. So formally, the distortion of a voting rule f on an input profile sigma is the ratio between the social welfare of the optimal solution, that one, the, uh, the, the one that optimized social welfare among the budget feasible subsets. And then in the uh, denominator, we have uh, the uh, social welfare that we're getting when we apply our voting rule to the input profile sigma. Now notice that both of these are measured according to some utility profile. What's the utility profile? It's going to be the worst case over all utility profiles that are consistent with the observed votes. Right? So basically for anything that our voting rule does, we ask how badly can it do compared to the optimal solution according to the worst utilities consistent with what we saw. So as advertised, this definition allows us to objectively compare different input formats by associating an input format with the worst case distortion of the best voting rule. What do I mean by that? For uh, 
every possible input profile, I take the voting rule that optimizes this distortion. That's going to be the best voting rule, and you can define it on every uh, input profile separately for a given input format. And then I look at the worst case. What's the worst case? It's the worst case over all possible vectors of, of, of observed votes, all possible input profiles. So what this is inherently capturing is uh, how useful the information encoded in the input format is for optimizing social welfare in the worst case. The theoretical results in the paper focus on giving bounds on the distortion associated with different input formats. So here are the results on a high level. The candidates are the four input formats we talked about, ranking by value, ranking by value for money, uh, knapsack voting, and threshold approval. And um, what we show is that for ranking by value, the distortion is order of square root of m. And similarly, for ranking by value for money, for knapsack voting, the distortion is much worse. It's order of M. And this is really horrible because you can get an upper bound of M on distortion by choosing a single alternative uniformly at random. So this is basically saying that the information encoded in NAPSEC votes is completely useless for this objective of optimizing social welfare. And in this competition, by far the leader is threshold approval where the distortion is only logarithmic in M, log squared of M. So this says that this information intuitively is much more useful for optimizing social welfare. Now, a really nice aspect of these theoretical results is that they're also very good predictors about what happens in the average case. So here are some results on the average case. What we did here was we got uh, real data generously given to us by Ashish Goel and his group. Uh, so uh, the data is from elections that they ran in Boston in 2015 and 16. Each one of them has a couple of thousand votes. And we took the real alternatives, the real costs of the alternatives, and the real votes. And from the votes, we extrapolated random utility profiles that are consistent with those votes. So this is where uh, things are random. And then once we have the utilities, we can translate them into any input format that we want and apply different aggregation methods and see how well the set of alternatives that we get is compared to the optimal solution on the, input for, on the uh, utility profile that we drew. So this is what we refer to as average welfare ratio. You know, that's just this, uh, the equivalent of distortion in this average case. Um, and I want to show you like a couple of things on this, uh, in this graph. So one thing to note is that the four leaders here are the uh, four input formats coupled with the optimal deterministic distortion minimizing aggregation method, the optimal voting rule. And what you can see is that they're sorted in the same way that, um, that we had them sorted in the theoretical results with a threshold approval first, then ranking by value for money, ranking by value, and NAPSAC. Another thing that's interesting is this uh, thing over here, greedy NAPSAC. Uh, so this is what was used, for example, in the Madrid election that I mentioned. What they do is they do NAPSAC voting, which they call shopping cart votes. And then to aggregate those votes, what they say is every time a voter puts an alternative in their subset, uh, they give that alternative one point. And then we just sort the alternatives by the number of points and greedily try to stick them into the budget until we run out of budget. So what you can see is that you know, even in the average case, this is doing significantly worse than these methods designed for the worst case. So the uh, take home message from this part is that threshold approval coupled with optimal distortion based aggregation stands out as a promising approach for participatory budgeting. Nevertheless, the jury is very much still out, even the jury inside my head, for various reasons. Uh, one is that uh, you know, if we go back to thinking about the cognitive burden on voters and how difficult it is for voters to understand what we want from them, Threshold approval is quite difficult to explain. So we actually have some ongoing human subject experiments with collaborators in Israel, uh, trying to understand like, how well this works when you actually get people to express their preferences in this format. But it's clear that it's not something that's easy to express to people. Another issue is that there are other completely different approaches that we have just started thinking about, where if some theoretical conjectures are true, this would give a very compelling alternative uh, to this approach. So like I said, I, you know, this is very much work in progress. I feel like really the jury is still out, but I think this points the way to some promising directions.
Yeah, so what we have here is a certain number of input formats and how well they do. But ideally, what we'd like to answer is the question, what is the optimal mm -hmm. input format of all possible? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so the question was, what's the optimal input format? And I think to make it a bit more precise, you would, you would need to ask, or at least like the way I think about it, is what's the optimal input format if I allow you some bound on communication, for example? So that's something that we have actually uh, been thinking about. And we have some results. Um, but you know, one caveat is that if you, you know, and I think you know, when we, in this case, like we have to care about the human aspect of it as well. So many of these input formats that give you optimal results are something that would be completely unintelligible to a person. Right? So there is th that issue where even if we optimize this measure theoretically, we might do really badly in that respect. Cool. So let me move on to the third part of the talk, uh, virtual democracy. So this is based on joint work with my student Ritesh Nutigatu, my colleague in the CMU machine learning department, Pradeep Ravi Kumar, and a team of collaborators at the MIT Media Lab led by Iyad Rahwan. So the starting point is this website created by our MIT collaborators called Moral Machine, where they try to understand how people behave in the modern incarnation of the classic trolley problem. So here the idea is that you have an autonomous vehicle that gets into an inevitable accident. Let's say it has a catastrophic brake failure. And um, some people will inevitably die and you have to make the grim decision who to kill and whom to save. So here's a, an example dilemma that a human visitor might face, a, you know, a user of this website. So you know, one option is driving straight uh, and killing the pedestrians and uh, the pedestrians are crossing on a red light and there's one overweight man, one male doctor, and one baby. Or the car can swerve, you know, take an, an active action, run into this roadblock and kill all of the passengers, and you can get all of the relevant information about the passengers. And one interesting thing about this particular dilemma is that if you look at the car, you can see there's a baby in the driver's seat of the car, which kind of makes sense because it's an autonomous vehicle, so you know, there could be a baby there. But by the same logic, this must be an autonomous stroller because nobody is actually pushing it. <laughs> and, if it and if you thought like this dilemma is wacky, look at this one where we have this daring escape from the animal shelter with five animals in the car, and we have to choose between the animals and the people. So most people are biased towards their own species and would choose to save the people over the animals. So this is a slightly easier dilemma. Um, but, you know, th so this is the type of dilemmas uh, they've shown to people. And like I said, their purpose was to understand how people make this type of decisions. They've been very, very successful at collecting data. So at the time of our collaboration, they had more than 18 million pairwise comparisons from more than 1.3 million voters. Right now, they have more than 40 million pairwise comparisons, so even more. Uh, and they, the starting point for our project was the realization that this vast treasure trove of data can actually be used to automate this type of decisions and not just to understand how people make them. So this has led to this, uh, you know, th this framework that we're proposing for automating this type of decisions. It has four steps. So the first step is data collection, basically asking people uh, you know, for pairwise comparisons on the dilemmas that we care about. The second step is learning. So here we would learn a model for each voter based on this, these pairwise uh, comparisons we collected, which will allow us to predict what they would want on dilemmas that we haven't seen before. The third step is summarization. So here the idea is that we're going to have to make uh, decisions in a split second in running time. And uh, we want to take all of these individual models and summarize them as one concise model of societal preferences. And finally, aggregation happens at runtime, so we're facing a particular set of alternatives that are the ones available right now. And the idea is we'll instantiate our model of societal preferences for the current alternatives, and we'll aggregate this model using ideas from social choice to get a, you know, a social choice of our virtual voters that will be the choice of our algorithm. So uh, you know, what we did in our work was we uh, instantiated this approach for the autonomous vehicle domain using a couple of specific design choices. And this has led to an implemented system that can make decisions in this autonomous vehicle domain. So I want to tell you in a few minutes about you know, what this instantiation of the approach looks like. So the first step is data collection. This was already done by our MIT collaborators who, like I said, collected a whole, a whole bunch of data. 
The second step is learning. Uh, so here we use a model for preferences called the thurston Mosteller model or the Thurston Model 5. Uh, there's no novelty here. This is off the shelf. The idea is that every voter has some mean utility for each alternative. And uh, to compare alternatives or to give a ranking, the voter would draw a sample from a normal distribution around each mean and would sort the alternatives in the order of those samples. So for example, here I might draw a sample for the red alternative, one for the blue, and one for the orange, and then I would sort those alternatives in this order, and it would give me blue above orange above red, even though the orange mean is larger than the uh, blue mean. Um, right, now what are the means? So we take a linear parameterization. The mean is the dot product of uh, a parameter vector beta for this voter, and the feature vector xi. So for example, in Moral Machine, there are 23 features. So it's things like, uh, are we looking at pedestrians or passengers? If pedestrians, are they crossing on a red light or on a green light? Uh, are we taking an active action by swerving or going straight? Information about the character types, you know, which characters we have in this dilemma, and so on. Right? And the parameter vector beta is what we're trying to learn. Now, for step three, at the end of step two, we've learned these 1.3 million thurston Mosteller models represented by these vectors of parameters, beta one to beta n. And now we do something very naive. Okay, so we, uh, we come up with one thurston Mosteller model for society where the parameter vector is just the average of all of these individual parameter vectors. So we have some theory that says that this is a reasonable thing to do, but I think the main justification will be the empirical results that I'll show you in two slides. Okay, so step four is actually where uh, almost all of our technical work uh, goes into in, in the paper and most of the innovation. So here uh, we now have one summary thurston Mosteller model for society. And at runtime we're given this particular subset of alternatives x1 to xm. Our model for society, given those uh, alternatives, would induce what's called an anonymous preference profile which you can think of as the prediction, predicted fraction of voters that are associated with any particular ranking over these alternatives. Now this is a type of uh, input that you can feed into most common voting rules. It's called an anonymous preference profile. However, there are two major questions here. One is how do we do this very fast? How do we apply the voting rule very fast? Because like I said, we may need to make decisions in a split second. And the second is which voting rule to use? Because over centuries, people have talked about many different voting rules. Which one is the most ethical? Now, we answer these questions in some generality in the paper. I just want to show you a special case of, our, of this theorem for the instantiation that I told you about. So the theorem would say that for any voting rule that satisfies two basic properties, monotonicity and neutrality, it would select an alternative that just maximizes the dot product of the average beta vector and the feature vector. So this is great news because one thing is that it's uh, you know, something that's very easy to compute, can be computed in a split second. And second, uh, you know, this uh, says that we don't need to worry too much about the choice of voting rule because most common voting rules satisfy these two basic properties and this says all of them would agree on the outcome. Yeah. The, the justification for step three seems a little weak because most of the time we're not going to be facing split second decisions. And also we can do it a lot more efficiently than just going through every one of the millions of votes. Right. So in, the, in this domain, the type of decisions we care about is when you get in an accident, you know, who do you kill? So these will all be split se second decisions. And in particular, you know, for this domain, um, you know, this does seem completely crucial. You're right that it wouldn't be crucial in every domain. There is an issue of computational complexity. So even if it's not a split second, there are very hard computational problems lurking behind the scenes here, especially if you have many models. Essentially, to make a decision, you have to unpack all of those models and apply a voting rule to that. So even if, you have, um, you know, even if you're in some environment with, where there is some dynamic interaction, and I'll, t I'll give a few examples later, it could still be too complicated if you don't have a concise model. Um, so it really depends on the setting, like in some others it may be uh, okay, and in fact one of the settings I'll talk about in a minute does have the property that we're not worried about summarization and we actually don't do that as part of the approach. Um, okay, so let me just show you um, uh, a couple of empirical results. So this graph pertains specifically to the accuracy of the summarization step, which I uh, promised to tell you a bit about. 
And what we're doing is we're looking at the, you know, the, these 1.3 million models that we've learned. In one world, we're taking a random subset of alternatives, instantiating it in all of these different models, and then applying a common voting rule called Borda and looking at which alternative won. In the second world, we do the same thing, but on the one summarized Thurston was stellar model, right? this, this naive average thing. And what we want to see is what's the probability these two things coincide. That would be the accuracy of our summarization. So what we're seeing here is accuracy is on the y-axis, the number of alternatives is on the x-axis. And even with 10 alternatives, the baseline of a random guess would be 10%, but still we're getting 95.1% accuracy. And you can see the accuracy degrades very slowly. So this says, you know, at least in this instantiation, uh, naive summarization works well. That said, I think there's still a lot more work to do here. There are very interesting technical questions about how to do summarization more cleverly. And also, it may well be the case that this kind of thing doesn't carry over to other domains. Right? So I'm not saying this is the final word on summarization, but at least for this particular application, it does pretty well. So as I mentioned, I think one thing that's exciting about this approach is that it applies not only to uh, autonomous vehicles, but to many other domains. So one example uh, is kidney exchange. That's a domain that I've actually worked in quite a bit, but in a different context. There's a recent paper by researchers from Maryland and Duke uh, where they take, uh, you know, independently propose a related but distinct approach based on social choice and machine learning. And what they want to do is, uh, you know, we're trying to find matchings between donors and patients. And uh, they want to break ties automatically between matchings of equal cardinality based on some automated prioritization of, of uh, specific patients given by preferences reported by people. So I think that's one exciting example. Another example that we've been working on, and this is where I alluded to summarization not being a big issue, is uh, uh, a food bank domain. So we've been working with an organization in Pittsburgh called 412 Food Rescue. This is a collaboration with a colleague of mine, Min Kyung Lee, who's been working with them for years. And the idea is that you know, they initially approached Min in order to build an algorithm that would automate their allocation decisions of incoming food donations to recipients. Uh, and what we are doing is applying an approach building on the one that I told you about in order to automate these decisions in a way that is uh, you know, ethical, fair, and also efficient to some degree. So right now, we're actually right now at the stage of collecting preferences from stakeholders in this organization, uh, you know, donors, recipients, uh, managers, and volunteers. But really, I think the same kind of approach would be applicable in many settings where uh, you have some AI and, uh, and, and some uh, degree of ethical decision making. So the take home message from this part of the talk is that we uh, have uh, built a system that I think serves as a proof of concept that it's possible to automatically decide ethical dilemmas without a formal specification of ground truth ethical principles. And I'm emphasizing this last part because I feel like that's been the main barrier to doing this kind of thing. The fact that philosophers have not given us a specification of ground truth ethical principles that we can then encode into our algorithms. So this approach is obviously practical, and I feel like it gives a way of making credible decisions, you know, especially when you think about the number of opinions that are involved, you know, 1.3 million in our case, or at the very least common sense decisions in this domain that is incredibly tricky uh, for AI. So to wrap up, let me revisit my overview slide one last time. So we talked about liquid democracy, we talked about participatory budgeting, we talked about virtual democracy. Uh, I've shown you results that I think of as relatively preliminary in all of these areas, but I do feel they point the way in promising directions. And I hope you'll leave the talk with the feeling that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, in the sense that you know, these are processes that are happening in the world uh, right now, and we can really play a role, I think, as computer scientists and, uh, in thinking about the evolution of these different paradigms. And I really feel like the time to do that is now, before various heuristics become ingrained, and while we still have a chance to sort of take a scientific viewpoint on shaping these different ideas and even to some degree, you know, helping think about the future of democracy. Thanks a lot. So maybe just one or two questions. Okay. Go ahead.
so why not use virtual democracy for everything? Instead of liquid democracy, instead of participatory budget, if the models are good, then we're done. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so the question was, why not use virtual democracy for everything? Um, so, you know, this is, um, I feel like the, some of the, you know, the, there are some inaccuracies that you would inevit inevitably get when you take this approach of machine learning. You know, we have various other results that say, how accurate is the learning step and so on. So obviously this leads to some sacrifice and some inaccuracy in how you represent preferences. So I feel like the trade-off is only worth it when there are issues like you need to make decisions in a split second, you know, you have a car, or, you know, in the case of uh, 412 food rescue, they're just uh, at the stage where they have scaled to the size where, you know, they just get so many donations, they can't handle them all. The equivalent of this approach would be to say, every time a donation comes in, get everybody together, the donors, the recipients, the managers, and so on, have everybody vote on wh where we should give the current donation and aggregate those preferences. Right? So in, in situations like that, that's not something that's realistic. Whereas this kind of approach does give us some way of, of you know, making this decision. I'd rather rep be represented by a model of me than by a representative who has, you know, that I have an agency problem with. Oh, I see. Well, so you're thinking of replacing uh, representative democracy with this. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to argue with you. Like, I, you know, I feel like our representatives often do uh, suffer from significant problems, and we can definitely, uh, I'm definitely not going to argue this point. Okay, one more question. Uh, maybe there's a bit more devil's advocate in that, uh, uh, it seems like a lot of the time democracy isn't for like social welfare. It's to prevent like uh, disastrous situations. So I think about like you know this liquid democracy. Like my my impression is this: if you go to like the corporate world and all these like stakeholder voting and voters trust or whatever, like it seems like you could try things there. But the reason they don't allow transfer votes is primarily for uh, robustness. And uh, and it seems like um, th there's this sort of uh, major tension once you have like rational agents because um, like throughout this, there's this major part that we're rational agents here and this felt like very much like uh, a, just a maximization problem. Once right. we have rational agents, it seems like everything's a mess. Right, uh, right. So, so just to, um, you know, rephrase, the, the point is, you know, we, we often in democracy want to make decisions in a way that would, for example, uh, prevent extreme situations, and one phenomenon we might be worried about, for example, is what's called tyranny of the majority, where we have a lot of incompetent people, whereas we could have had a few competent representatives who would have made the right decision. So, um, you know, this is definitely uh, a flaw of democracy in general. We get this flaw also potentially when we choose representatives or other uh, office holders. Uh, so I feel like it's, it's very hard to overcome or like completely escape these flaws of democracy if you do any kind of democracy. And I think, you know, what I'm doing here is taking a very positive viewpoint of democracy in the sense that, you know, also when I'm thinking about virtual democracy and participatory budgeting, you could also say, why do you want the citizens to, to make those kinds of decisions even though we do have some positive evidence? Um, so I'm taking a very positive viewpoint in that democracy definitely has its flaws, uh, but it often works well. And I'm a big believer in the fact that it does work well overall and usually gives us pretty reasonable solutions. I agree with you that if we did want to implement direct democracy or liquid democracy, you know, something that is more direct, we would probably need some additional safeguards in place. Uh, so this approach wouldn't directly uh, address that, but you could think about doing liquid democracy according to approaches that uh, will build on some of the stuff we talked about. And in addition, putting some additional safeguards in place, for example, giving veto power to particular people. Um, right? So I feel like you know, dealing with this issue could arguably be orthogonal to some of the issues we talked about. Okay, well, let's thank Ariel and take more questions. Off.